That was so tangible, so tangible, so tangible. I want to read two scriptures before we get into the message. The book of Psalms, chapter 91, from verse 1 to 2, if you have your Bibles. Go to the book of Psalms, chapter 91, from verse 1 to 2. If you're there, say amen. If you're too lazy and you can't get it, look up in the screen, amen. Amen. Psalms, chapter 91, from verse 1 to 2. Not 92, my... It's 91, my guys. It's okay. God bless you. Amen. I, I read it. The Bible says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. In the book of Psalms, chapter 22, verse 3, it says, But you are holy, you who inhabit the praises of Israel. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you because it will not return to you void, but it will do what it needs to accomplish, Almighty God. And I pray not only for an expectation from the heart of your people, but a position of assurance, knowing that if you say it, you will do it in their lives, Almighty God. A faith that will expound and express the truth of your word. A faith and a heart that will express the spirit of worship in this house. I thank you and I give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It's, a, it's an honor, privilege to fellowship with you guys. Um, I really want to honor the father of the house, Pastor Sam, Apostle Sam, everything Sam. <laughs> um, he's inspired me since day one, since um, he came, you know, a man that came to play soccer at camp, but God gave him a word, amen. Um, and from there he stood. Um, the, the journey that we've gone through, there's a lot of ups and downs. But there's some people that don't lose their faith. And for, for me, I see that in the life of Pastor Sam. Um, I have brothers that, are, that we were there together, but they left. But this man stood. So you guys have a powerhouse preacher in the house, a powerhouse teacher. A man that will take you guys to where you need to be because he's a man after God's heart. So I really honor that and we thank you for your yes. Um, and beside or in front of every great man, there is a greater woman. Why? Because... You, you know, you, you know, man can only carry a seed, but woman can birth out a child. Amen. Miriam, we really honor you for, for being a first lady because a lot of people don't like to be a pastor's wife, but you've said yes and you do it with joy. So, really honor you. You're really blessed. Uh, the, I remember meeting Miriam at camp as well, and she beat me in a race. Until this day, I'll never forget it. It's embarrassing, but. <laughs> You know, you win some, you lose some, amen. I want to honor all the other pastors in the house, Pastor Sabir, um, Pastor Sunday, and any other one that I've missed out, um, any other leader, every leader, you guys are doing really well, and growth is really happening. Um, in the short period of time that, you know, um, the, the church was launched out, there's growth happening. One thing that I really see in this house is joy, the joy to come and serve. Um, it's tough. When you become too comfortable serving God, you, you, you serve him out of strife, but you don't serve him out of joy. Amen. But we thank God because the Bible says that his mercy is new every single morning, every single day. Amen. I have a word for you guys. Um, and if you're ready for that word, I want you to say amen. 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 And, and I love this. I love notebooks are open. Pastor Sam, you're doing... Well, I, I tell my people back there, I don't care if you're... 75 years old or you're 21 write if you have to write in english even if it's just one scripture write at least because you know if you're here just to watch me believe me you get what you want to see you know you know you see me this is me tomorrow you forget about me but, but if you're here for a word from god you need to be a good steward of the word of god a good student of the word of god amen um, I, I believe this month god is taking you guys through a topic or a theme of submission and, and this afternoon i want to I want us to understand a few aspects of submission. Uh, before I go forward, I want to give a shout out to my sister Peace and the kids. <laughs> Great supporter. That's my, that's my best friend, you know. Now nah, chill out, chill out. <laughs> and, uh, she's, she's hosted me very well um, coming to Brisbane. I feel like this is my second home anyways. I'm always here. Um, every time I'm here, you guys, um, you know, you guys show me a good time. I'm here for a good time, not a long time. Amen. 
Um, but yeah, we, we, we want to look at a few different aspects of submission. Um, and when we teach the Word of God, it, it's the best thing to teach. So to preach, people get excited, you know, you, you feel the move of God. But before the Spirit of God even moves, it requires a word. We see that in Genesis. Before we, ex- we should expect to move from God, we should expect a word. We should desire to run after a word. Because the Spirit of God can do nothing without a word. Amen. So if you want more spirit, get more word inside of you. Amen. Amen. So this afternoon, I want us to understand a few aspects about submission. The first thing you need to understand is that your submission begins from a place of surrender. You cannot submit if you can't surrender. Amen. The first thing that God requires from us is to surrender. Not a part of us. We are great at surrendering a part of us to God. But God desires the complete you. Amen. Amen. Secondly, I want you to understand that your submission in the house, where you serve, will allow you to be covered by the house. Amen. Your submission in the house, where you serve, wherever you are, will allow you to be covered by the house. The blessings of the house automatically becomes yours when you learn to submit. Amen. It, it, I, I'm not even just talking about the house in general, the, 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 the church. I'm also speaking about your homes. If you want to experience the blessings of your father and mother, you need to learn to submit. Amen. A rebellious child will always go outside to partake or eat from outside. But there's no food like home food. Amen. Amen. There's no food like home food. Um, all, all, All the time we ask ourselves, why is there a lack of covering? It's not that there's a lack of covering. The problem is there's a lack of submission. Amen. Amen. There's a lack of submission. Your submission to the foundation of the house will bring stability on how you will dwell in the house. The Bible says, He who dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. Amen. So if you want to experience the shadows of God, you need to dwell in the house. Dwelling does not mean visiting the house, but it means living in the house. You become accustomed to to the foundation of the house. You become accustomed to the different rooms in the house. You, You know how powerful it is? When you know your house so well, you don't need the lights on in order to go to the bathroom or go to the kitchen, but you just sense that I know something is here, something is there. You know the structure. Amen. In the same way, when you dwell in the secret place, sometimes the light does not have to be on in order to hear God. Sometimes the light does not need to be on in order to experience God. Even in the darkest moments of life, like Job, he will never curse God because he dwelt in the presence of God. He dwelt with God. Amen. That God, imagine God says, have you considered my son Job. The question is, are you dwelling with God enough that even if the devil tries to come and test, God will say, do you consider my son Sabir? Take him to court. <laughs> and what happens? He did not go crazy. He didn't say, hey, Pastor Sam, I'm going to court. Pray for me. Let's go and fast. But he knew who he was. He knew that the accuser may come to try and accuse him, but he knew who he was. He knew who was with him. He knew the presence that was, that was going before him. Amen. He knew his verdict was already not guilty. Amen. Lastly, your submission will allow you to steward the presence of God in the direction in which God desires to take you. Amen. Book of Exodus chapter 33, 14 to 15. The Bible says, And he said, My presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. Then Moses said to God, he said, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Moses understood that he needed to submit to the presence of God in order to have any chance of even entering the promised land. We know he failed at the end because he detached himself from the presence. He went away from being obedient and he'd enter the promise. But he, he knew the assignment required him to submit to the presence of God. And I really sense in this season for this church, There is a cry that has been coming out that God, if your presence does not lead us, we don't want to go. We don't want to go. If your presence is not the one being our GPS, we don't want to go. Amen. Amen. And and I really feel like God is saying to you guys that the submission of uh, your submission to the presence of God, number one, it's going to establish a level of believers that will understand how to steward the presence of God. There's believers that are going to come that is going to going to be established because of your submission to the presence of God. Amen. And secondly, your submission as a church is going to increase the capacity 
to, to allow God to inhabit you in fullness. Amen. Because the greatest nature of God is that he is a God of inhabitants. He loves to inhabit. The Bible says that, that what? He, he is holy. He inhabits the praises of Israel. Amen. God created the earth so he could inhabit in creation. He created you so that he could live in you. Amen. Amen. And he, he, he designed praise and worship. He designed, because his desire for us first was not to really work, but it was to praise him, to worship, to walk with him in the garden. Amen. And he designed that so that, so that he can inhabit the praise of his people. And I want you to understand that your praise is simply this. It is the person you raise up above you. Your praise is the power that you raise up above you. Your praise is the presence that you raise up above you. And when you posture yourself, submitting yourself under this power, this presence of this person, you allow this power, this person, this presence to influence you. Amen. God inhabits us to influence us and infiltrate through us. Number one, he influences our image to make us to look like him. And number two, he infiltrates our likeness to be more like him. God's initial desire is that you look more like him first. A lot of us want to do things for God, but God says, hey, you need to look like me first before you can do the things that I want to do. Amen. As soon as Adam and Eve exchanged their image, their birthrights, God said, you know what? Go out of my presence and go and labor. Amen. They started to do what God did not design them to do first because they exchanged who they are. They exchanged their identity for the enemy. Amen. But God had to restore the image through Christ. So now every time we actually do things, God does not see us. He sees Jesus Christ. Amen. Because Jesus Christ is an intercessor. Amen. He restored our image. The word inhabits can be broken into two words, which truly dictates God's role and our role. The, the, it's broken up in two words, in and habits. God stewards his presence by simply being present in a vessel, in you. That is what God desires, to simply be in you. His work is done. After the seventh day, he said, I'm done. Now I want to be in you. I want, to, I want to be in you so I can work through you. Amen. He wants to be in his creation. He wants to be in your plans. He wants to be in your ideas. He wants to be in your destiny. Amen. The, you know, the moment you take God out is the moment you remove the responsibility of God to move in your life. You say, God, I can do it by myself. The moment you take him out. The moment you want to do something and you don't consider God, even praying for food, you know, it's very, very important because you're saying, God, I want you to be part of this meal. Amen. But me, I forgot. I forget so many times. But the moment you take God out from the simplest plan, the moment you say, God, let me take the will. And then when, it's about, when you're about to crash and you say, Jesus, take the will. And it's like, yo, where were you from the beginning? Amen. Our role in stewarding the presence of God is found in our habits habits, our spiritual habits, our emotional habits, our physical habits. Amen. Our, your hab, you, know, you will know a person by their habits. You will know their end results by their habits. A lot of us will say we have dreams. We want to get to this place. We want to be big CEOs, big businessmen. Just look at their habits. What time do they wake up in the morning? Does it, does it align to their vision? If you want to know a man is a man of vision, look at their habits, their daily habits. Because it's the incremental daily habits that will, what's it called, build you up to the end goal. Amen. Amen. So how can we define habits? A habit is, through dictionary, not the Bible, is a, a habit is a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. When a habit gets in you so much, it is hard for you to give up. It's, it's a part of you. Let me, let me ask you guys a very simple question. Who struggled today to brush their teeth? Uh, no one, right? You, 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 you don't even think about it. It's innate. It's in you. You wake up and you're like, yo, I need to brush my teeth. Amen. It's not something that you really have to struggle with or, or think about. It's, 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 it's natural. And just like brushing your teeth, there are some habits that need to be automatic in your life. 
There's some spiritual habits that need to be automatic. If you are still in a place where you're struggling with prayer, you haven't made it, you haven't made it a habit yet. If you're in a place where you're still struggling to read the Word of God, you have not made it a habit yet. Amen. Amen. And I want to give you guys a few habits. Take what you can take. Leave what you don't need. But once you capture these habits, God is going to cause you to be so full of his presence that he'll trust you. He'll trust you. You know, we, we, we trust God so much, but God needs to trust us as well. Amen. So the first habit is H, which is honor. It's a habit of sowing a seed. Amen. Sabir so already spoke about it perfectly, but I'm not here to speak about money. Every time we think about a seed, we limit it so much to money that we don't understand that our giving is beyond money. Yeah. Amen. If giving was all about money, we, did, we don't need Jesus Christ. God should have just gave us a million dollars. But he knew if he gives you something materialistic, you lose it easily. Because a lot of us, our habits of spending is crazy. Amen. If we all had a million dollars right now, by the end of next year, some of us are back to where we are. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But our giving is, is beyond that. Our, our giving is beyond materialistic. Our giving is more intimate than it is materialistic. Amen. There, there's a simple principle here. A simple equation of honor. Honor equals multiplication. Whenever you read a scripture in the Bible, whenever, whenever honor is mentioned, after that we see that there's multiplication or addition after honor. Amen. In the book of Proverbs chapter 3 from 9 to 10, the Bible says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will, will flow uh, over the brim with new wine. Honor equals multiplication. Honor equals sustenance. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20 verse 12, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you honor your mother and your father, there's long life. Sustenance. You are sustained. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, 2 to 3. The Bible says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. The biggest debate will be, do we honor our parents that are not really being parents to us? But it, it, it's not saying honor a good or a bad father. It simply says honor your father or your mother. It's, it's, it's the principle that's, that's important here that you need to learn. It's not what we honor. Rather, it's who we honor. That, 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 that is important. The, the, the honor that is due first is an honor unto God. That's why the first commandment is always honor the Lord your God. Amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13. Honor the Lord your God. Worship him only and make your promise in his name alone. You honor God first and you honor his nature of being omnipotent. God is everywhere at the same time. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's the almighty God. Amen. He's the all-knowing God. He created all things through him for us. Amen. So when, whenever we sow a seed, the potential of that seed is in its fruit, the fruit that it bears, right? But, but the power of the seed is not in the seed actually, but it's in the one who created the seed. Amen. Amen. So our honor is not unto a seed. It's, the, the, the honor is not the act that you do, like Sabir mentioned before. It's, it's not the, the act of sowing that proves your honor. The Bible says that they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far. If it was about the acts that we do, believe me, there's some people here that do the most for the Lord. But the question is, where's your heart? What's the position of your heart? Because you can do so much, but if your heart is not with him, he will not say good and faithful servant. He will say, I don't know you, but he said, but God, look at what I did. But God will say, who are you? The honor should be attached to your identity more than your works. Amen. Amen. Our honor is not unto our father and mother first, but it's unto God. Amen. The, the habit of honoring is not to gain. So we, I'll, I'll preach about the congregation and then I'll get to the pastors and then everyone else. You don't honor Pastor Sam to gain anything from him. Amen. You know, the more you honor God, the more you find yourself simply honoring man. The more you love God, the more you find yourself just loving man. Not because of what they do for you, but simply because that's the equation of God. Love God, love yourself, then love your neighbors. 
Amen. I, I, I found that this is the best way to respond to anyone at all. People that use you, people that abuse you, people that accuse you, the best way to respond is to love God. Don't love them or hate them. Don't respond to the man. Respond to the spirit, which is God. Then God will give you the way to respond to the person. Amen. Amen. The habit of honoring is not to gain a multiplication, nor is it to gain long life. But the habit of honoring is to place God in the position of Him being the Lord of your life. When you honor God, you make Him your covering. Amen. A is being attentive or being aware. Not to what is necessary visible, but to the presence that is not seen. This is a habit of faith. Amen. Jesus asked a very simple question that came out of frustration to the disciples. He says, uh, he says, for how long shall I be with you in the book of Matthew 17, 7? He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here. This is a story of a boy that was demon possessed. The disciples went and tried to, you know, cast him out and, you know, they couldn't. So they said, yo, master, what's going on? How come we can't do this? And Jesus got mad. Let me translate it in the Raymond version of the Bible because I believe Jesus was, was saying some things. And he, he, he was like, bruh, there's a lack of faith that I'm seeing here. How long do you want me to, 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 to be with you physically? How long do you have to be seeing me physically in order to use the faith and authority that I've already given you? You know, a lot of the times... Because we have a spiritual covering like our spiritual father and mother here, we wait until they're in our presence, then we act. Why? Because we want to be seen by them, that we can still move in the things of God. We, we want to do things to please them. That was the same way the disciples were, they, they were, they were like, is Jesus around? All right, let's try and cast this demon. Is Jesus around? All right, let, let's, you know, let's give good food. Amen. But the things that you do in secret... God sees it, and God still honors that. The honor that you give should never be in front of people. Or I should say this, the faith that you, that you show should never just be in front of people. I have found that the greatest way that God has moved me has never been on the pulpit. It's never been in front of a crowd. It's always been behind closed doors. Amen. Because you are sowing seeds of faith in the secret place. The Bible says what you do in the secret, God will honor it in the public. In other words, God will multiply what you are sowing in secret. The best prophetic words I've given is in the shower. The best worship I've given is in the shower. I don't have to speak to somebody, but it's in the shower. Because I know God is not a God that is limited by barriers. By me speaking a word over someone, they don't, I don't have to go to them and say, I have a word for you, but I've already sown the seed and it's traveling. And God is going to do what he has to do. The Bible says that Paul said that I sowed Apollos water, but God brings the increase. Amen. The increase does not look like how we want it to look like sometimes. Amen. The increase does not look like how we work for it sometimes, but let God do it anyways. Don't limit God based on your own perspective. But but bring God to a place where you say, God, my faith is here. Use it. My faith is here. Use it. So Jesus was saying, how long do I have to be with you physically before you use the faith and authority I've given you? He said, let me remind you once again what faith is. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance in the things we don't see. Amen. We don't see. We don't see. Don't, don't allow things that you see to motivate your faith. But the things that you don't see, let that motivate your faith. The healings that we haven't seen yet, let it bring a burden in us that God, we want to see it. The miracles that we haven't seen yet, the financial blessings that we haven't seen yet, let that be the thing that brings the faith. You know, I, I, the, the scripture speaks about how, you know, like, um, I think it's, I don't know if it's the other way around, but prophecies for like the non-believers or tongues for the non-believers. Anyways, the point is here that that the, the, the signs and wonders are actually for non-believers to point them to God. But once you get into a deep, intimate relationship with God, you don't have to see anything. God has already proved himself. His love is enough. Amen. His love is enough. We, we need to begin to pay attention to the things that we don't see physically, but rather spiritually. And I really sense in this season, in this church, that God is opening spiritual eyes. 
so deeply. There's spiritual eyes that are being opened for you to begin to see beyond the flesh, beyond the physical. See beyond your structure. See beyond your announcements. See beyond the days that you're doing things, but see deeply what God is doing in the spirit. Amen. The habit of faith is continuously being filled with the spirit of God. That's a habit of faith. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not be drunk, Sabir, with wine, in which is dissipation. You preach my message today, Sabir. <laughs> but be filled with the Spirit of God. You want to see what God is doing? Be filled with the Spirit of God. You want to do what God is doing in this season? Be filled with the Spirit of God. You want to move in complete faith? Be filled with the Spirit of God. The Bible says that we have the Spirit of faith. The same spirit of faith that was in Christ, we have it. It, may, it, it. it announces faith to be a spirit. Amen. And it's saying that you have that same spirit. Amen. The Bible says that the spirit of God is what leads us. Not the excitement of man is what leads us. Not, not the decoration of our church. Not the decoration of our worship. Not the decoration of our messages. But it's the spirit of God that should lead us. And I really believe that this church has attached himself, themselves to the spirit of God. And God is about to honor that. God is about to multiply because you have attached yourself to being led by the Spirit of God. Amen. There's an awareness that is coming into this house. And I prophesy over you and your families right now. That the Spirit of God will become so aware in you. You become so aware of the Spirit of God in you. That you'll be giving birth to the supernatural in this season. In Jesus mighty name. B. If you don't get it, we're spelling out habit. H-A-B. <laughs> H-A-B-B is behold. And behold is the, is the habit of accepting newness. Man, in the African culture, to accept something new is, is very hard. We have some fixed-minded, hard-headed, rock-headed individuals. Amen. <laughs> but when you want to bring a new style or something, man, this, this is not how we used to do it. And we say perfect. That is a beautiful word because you said used to. That's what you used to do. It worked back then. It's not going to work today. God is not someone that likes to mix the old with the new. Amen. He's not someone that wants to say, oh, focus on the old. He says, consider not the old things. He says in Isaiah chapter 43, 19, behold, I will do a new thing. He's saying, I will do. God is in, is in constant business of still moving. He's still working. I will do a new thing. It, now it shall spring forth. Sometimes we feel like the new thing is going to come from above, but do you know things spring forth from underneath? From your foundation. From your submission. Amen. Springs forth. Shall you not know it? It will even make a road in the wilderness. And rivers in the desert. To behold. Is being able to let go of what is old. And begin to hold on to what is new. When you begin to let go of the pains of the wilderness. I know a lot of you guys are in a wilderness season. But God is saying, let go of the pain of the wilderness. Let your perspective be shifted. So from I am going through a wilderness season to I am in this wilderness season, but I'm in this wilderness season with God. Amen. Amen. Cedric, Meshach, and Abednego put us in the fire. Even if God does not save us. A lot of us say, God save us. They said, even if God does not save us, we will still worship him. The worship was not defined by how God will save them or not save them, but their worship was defined by how they loved God. Amen. Amen. You want to see new things in your life? Just love God. Love God. Love God. Don't wait for Him to rescue you. Wait for Him to love you. And I got good news from you, for you. He loved you since, what, 2023 years ago? He loved you since then. He loved you even before Jesus came. Before you were even in your mother's womb. Whoever that child is, his they. Eh, did I say he? She? They. <laughs> She's loved by God. Even before the parents are going to love her. God loves her. That is what sustains us. That's why God says, honor your father and mother. Even though they don't love you, God loves you. Even though they don't care for you. They, they look at you. They curse you. say you amount to nothing. God believes in you. And he said, I will do a new thing. Amen. Amen. And this, this is, is a good, good word. When you begin to let go of the deserts that is affecting your life, the desert that is affecting your finances. I know some people are going through a dry season. But believe me, God is bringing a financial blessing because you are submitting yourself to beholding that he is doing a new thing. Amen. You're submitting yourself 
that is doing a new thing. When you, when you begin to let go of the desert that is affecting your relationships and your family, you've seen so much unfruitfulness in everything. You've tried everything. But God is simply saying, behold, I'm doing a new thing. God has promised to so many people things here, and you're saying, God, when is it coming? It's already come. The problem is your perspective. It says, do you not know it? Asking you the question, do you not know it? Do you not see it? Amen. Th this habit takes away from you being worried because you know that God is going to make a way. This habit takes away doubt because you know God will do. Amen. God is doing a new thing in this ministry. <laughs> I, you guys just need to see it. You need to see it. I really, just in that worship, believe me, I sense such a great shift that has taken place. And not, not to get you excited about a crowd, but about an impact. Thousands are going to be impacted by what is happening here. Your submission to God in your worship, thousands are going to be touched. Amen. Your submission to service. I loved how Patrick, man, came with so much enthusiasm just to give announcements. <laughs> Amen. He, he spoke like he was preaching. Amen. That's what we need. Amen. You attract them like that. Amen. That, that, that's what the heart of service should be. The Bible says be a good or a cheerful giver. Your service should always come from a place of joy. Amen. Because joy is contagious. Amen. Happiness is not contagious. Happiness is a feeling. Joy is a state of being. When someone is joyful, it doesn't matter if things are working. It doesn't matter if there's five people in this crowd or 5,000. You will still speak with complete joy. Amen. And I feel like God is about to cause that state in this church. Amen. In this city, a state of joy. Amen. We're getting there. We're finishing off our spelling. I is for intimacy. Which is a habit of communication and communion. Amen. Communication, sorry, communication and consecration. Communication is simply to commune with the Father. It is a place of union. There is something significant that Christ said when he was having a physical communion with the disciples. He said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. He said, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We, we do not only remember what Christ did. Dying on the cross for our sins, raised from dead, he gave us salvation. But we need to remember why he did it. A lot of us look at the actions of God, but we don't look at the motive of God. You know, when, when you attach yourself to the motive of God, you don't go anywhere. You're not shaking anymore. Once you know the why of God, why he picked you out of so many people. I believe there's about 8 billion people in the world, but why did he pick you? Why you to do what you do? When you understand the motive of God, you run. The Bible says in John 10, 10, this is the why. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it in what? Full. Sometimes we're robbing, we're robbing God. Sometimes we're, we're, we're saying, God, you, we know you're good, but you're not all that. Because we only take half. When he says, yo, I have so much more and you want to take half. Amen. Don't you know you're a child of God, so valued by Him? He wants you to have full. Amen. Because God is a God of abundance. He has so much more. I've, I've had a friend at uh, church, when they first came, you know, um, to church, they were like, man, do, can, I, can I go twice for an altar call? I know I've already went once, but I feel like maybe that's for someone else, you know? I said, bruh, God will fill you up and He'll fill the other person up. He'll fill 8 billion people in this world and there's still more that He has for you. Amen. So if you feel the need to keep running after God, believe me, there's still more that's going to come. Amen. His, his equation is that he fills you up so he can overflow. God, God is, is, not a, is not a tap that you turn on and off. God is an ocean where you just dive in. If you want to drown in the things of God, believe me, God will, will allow you to drown in it. Some of you guys just need to rest and drown in what God has for you. Amen. It, that, that's why the Bible says, don't be drunk of wine. Wine is what? Wine is the things of this world. Some of us want to be drunk in our worries more than we want to be drunk in the goodness of God. Some of us want to be drunk in our striving, in the things that's going on more than being drunk in the Spirit of God. Amen. I know us black people don't like swimming, but God is saying today. Amen. Today. <laughs> today is about to, you need to dive into the fullness of life that God has for you. Amen. Let, let us vindicate what Jesus came to do by being a testament 
of what he has done for us, which is to have life and life in fullness. Amen. Every time we're in communication with God, we're reminded what life truly is. Communication is in the form of prayer, supplication, worship, hymns, fasting, and many other ways. And that simply reminds us that we're a new creation. Amen. So every time you enter into prayer, you ought to experience that fullness of life. Every time you enter into worship, it should be a result of life coming out. Our, our, our worship should be living worship. Our prayers, our, our gatherings should be alive. You should feel more alive in church than you do in the world. But a lot of the times, half of us are sleeping in church. But when it comes to, you know, closing prayer, somehow we are awake and ready to go fellowship. Amen. Amen. But life should be in God more than it should be in the world. Amen. You are a new creation. You inherit everything that God has for you. You inherit health. You inherit health. You inherit homes. Amen. We should not look at the world and say, man, this world is building better houses than we are. But us Christians should be building the best houses we should. Amen. That's why I thank God for my sister because she has a fine house. Amen. Praise God. It runs in the family. Our two shall have a fine house. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Intimacy. It's a habit of communication and consecration. Consecration means to be set apart. And I feel like God wants to simply remind us as an ascended church that we've been set apart. We've been called for the greater calling. Not the calling of the old, but the calling of new. Not a mediocre calling, amen. We, we don't have to conform to how people are moving, but let us continuously be transformed by how God is moving in this season. Your intimacy will cause you to walk with Him. Even if you have to walk through the valley of the shadow and death, you will not fear, but you continue having faith. Amen. T is for testimony, which is a habit of proclaiming and declaring. Amen. It proclaims the victory of God. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. The only thing you have to remind the devil when it comes to warfare is the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Amen. And they did not love their lives to death. It declares that God has the ability to do it again. That's what testimonies do. We're, we see in the book of Matthew chapter 14, 35 to 36, the Bible says, And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out all, the, all that surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and, uh, and, and besought him and they, that, that they might touch the hem of his garment as many has touched where were made perfectly whole. The question is whether these people get this revelation that you can touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Well, if, if we read two chapters before, they realize that there was a woman that had a testimony. She was the woman with the issue of blood. And she said, if only I touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Amen. A testimony is not only a word of knowledge. It's not only a word of wisdom. A testimony is not only a recount, but it is a prophecy. Every time you testify, you're prophesying. Amen. When you testify, you're not telling us only about the victory that has happened to you, but you're telling me that the God that moved through you can move through me. Amen. So we should always be running and testifying. I, I, I think the word is here. Don't, don't shut your mouth anymore. Don't let anyone stop you from sharing your testimony. Even if we've heard it a thousand times. We have those people in church, amen. Those crazy people that always want to come and say, I have something. And a lot of us are saying, oh, here we go again. <laughs> but at least they are prophesying. But you, you're closing your mouth and saying, oh man, maybe my testimony is not good enough. You saying your testimony is not good enough, you're saying your God is not good enough. Amen. But I know my God is good. I know my God is good and he's good always, Amen. Do you know the reason why God will appear to someone and say, I'm the God of your fathers, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, is because he wants to remind you what he has done in their lives, he can do it through you. The Old and the New Testaments are simply testimonies of what God did. Amen. They are, they are recounts of what God did. And I believe there's a, a new and newer testament that is happening right now in our season. Amen. That is a testament of the Holy Spirit that is moving in this place. Amen. God is saying that he will do it again. So God wants to say to you this, this, this afternoon, have courage, be bold, and become loud. Amen. Go back on Facebook Live, that person that stopped going. And that person that hasn't started and God said, go, go. Wherever God has told you to go, speak your testimony. Go. Speak your testimony. Be bold. Because I've realized that it, people don't have to respond on your life saying, I'm touched. But a few years later, you hear someone say, yo, 
I did not know you, but you said something. You said a word, and that word transformed my whole life. Amen. I spoke over someone's life about some, you know, in the prophetic, I was just speaking, and it was something about, you know, um, get jasmine oil randomly. It's hard to get jasmine oil anywhere. I said, get jasmine oil, go and what's it called? Anoint your house. And they're like, jasmine oil. And this person, good steward of the word again. Because I don't know what I'm saying, but they received the word and they said, God, what is jasmine? They went and researched and they realized that you can only order it, you know, special jasmine oil. And then they said, okay, I'm going to order it. Then God said, no, don't order it. Eight months later, they go to Adelaide. They go to Adelaide. For some reason, they're supposed to come home after a few months. But for some reason, they said, you know what? I'm going to stay in Adelaide. You know, I feel like God has caused me to stay. They moved from where they were. They moved to another, to another what's it called, um, place. And they were speaking to this lady. And this lady, randomly, just speaking to them. And in that moment, while they're speaking, I call her. And she doesn't pick up. I call her, she doesn't pick up. And when I was calling her, the same time I called her, the lady said, you know this tree that we're looking at? This tree is a jasmine tree. And this jasmine tree can be made, you can make jasmine oil from it. And she said, What? <laughs> And God said, this is the word that I spoke to you eight months later. Sometimes the, the seeds that you've sown years ago, you may have given up on them. But God does not give up on the seed that is sown. God values every seed that is sown. Amen. Have courage, speak. And I believe there's a testimony that's about to pioneer a prophetic move in this house. The testimony that Sam got from God pioneered him to this season. And there's testimonies that are coming now through each Every person that is here, attach yourself to the move that God wants to do in this house. And believe me, God is about to do it again in so many people's lives. Amen. And the final habit that I want to leave you guys with, and I believe is the most important habit, is the habit of stillness. Amen. Stillness. A lot of us have been diagnosed with spiritual ADHD. Amen. We cannot stay still. We're moving up and down, up and down. We want to do this. God, yeah, yeah, let me do it, let me do it. Oh, I got a word. The word isn't finished yet. You're saying, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. But sometimes you need to be still. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 46, verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. Amen. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still and know that I am God. This habit of stillness allows you to live in the perspective of God. There, there are two perspectives of the word know. The first perspective speaks about education. Amen. Head knowledge. Where the mind is discovering who God is. It's, it's about the Logos word. Amen. That's why it's important to read the word. Even if you're not led to read the word, read the word. Just read it. Make it a habit where you read. You don't have to feel it to read the word. It, what is written is enough. It's enough revelation already. Amen. Just read it. Even the Old Testament, Genesis, I know it's dry. I know ex Leviticus is the most driest book in the Bible. But read it. Amen. Because you will find great gems in that word. Amen. Read it. You know, it, it, the, the Logos word allows you to form the mind of Christ. The Bible says you have the mind of Christ. This mind of Christ allows you to think like Christ thinks. Amen. Your mind is so important because it registers knowledge that comes in. Your mind is the one that takes knowledge and puts it into the place it needs to be. Your mind can kill the knowledge that, that comes into you. Before the word goes into your heart, it goes into your mind first. Because your ears is located closer to your mind than your heart. So you hear it goes into your mind. It, it does what it needs to do. So if your mind is full of worries, believe me, a good word will become mixed up in what's so called, in worries. And you know what happens when you put one bad fruit in a basket of good fruit? The good fruit does not change the contaminated fruit, but the contaminated fruit changes the good fruit. Amen. So get your mind right. The second perspective of the word no is about revelation. Education, revelation. The deepest level of intimacy where the Bible describes, it says that Adam knew his wife Eve. A man will know their wife. And I was like, duh, knew his wife. But then because after, then the Bible says Adam knew his wife and then they bore a son. I was like, what? How do you just know someone and then you're giving birth? But then I learned that that, that is the deepest level of in intimacy. It's translated doing the thing, you know what I'm saying? What I'm, doing the thing. And then you give a bed. <laughs> you give bed. In that, that deep level of intimacy, you know what happens? You, you take off every external layer and you become so vulnerable to relate to somebody. A lot of us think an act is just simply an act. That's why they say don't do it before you get married. Why? Because you're, you're, you're literally becoming so vulnerable to someone and you're allowing a transfer between each other, an exchange. Amen. You allow their problems to become your problem. 
You allow the, you know, the, the winds to become your wind. You allow the demons to become your demons. But the deep level of intimacy knowledge, when you begin to know God in that level of intimacy, where you allow yourself to be so vulnerable, there's an exchange. You allow God's goodness to become your goodness. He takes your shame. He takes your pain. And it gives you Him. Amen. That's the deepest level of intimacy. The habit of intimacy is to discover God through education, the Logos word, and through revelation, the Rema word. It's very important to have the balance. Amen. And those, those two cannot live without each other. You can't be a spiritually led person that is not educated. You, you can't just live off the spiritual high and not have a biblical foundation. Amen. Or else you don't even know what to do with the revelation that God gives you. If you don't allow yourself to be educated. Amen. I think a study was done and Christians look like the most dumbest people. I don't know why. Because they're too busy consuming themselves. Like, let, let's just be over spiritual. Amen. But they don't want to educate themselves. They don't want to ground themselves. Amen. Amen. But I believe that in this season that you guys are going through, God is bringing such a stability where you're going to run after and desire the word of God. Where you're going to run after and desire the spirit of God. God is bringing a, a, a deep, divine, spiritual, habited people. Amen. God is bringing an open, he's, he's almost like he's, he's opening a basket and saying, let me fill you up. It's almost like he's opening a vessel in each person and he said, I'm going to pour you out because you have put in the right habits to allow me to fill you up. The Bible says that he is holy and he inhabits the praises of his people. In this season, if you raise God up above all things, believe me, you're going to experience more of God like never before.